Amen. Well, take your Bibles and turn with me to Ruth chapter 2. Ruth chapter 2 uh, is where our text is going to be uh, this morning as we continue uh, in our series that we began last week through the Old Testament book of Ruth. And we've just simply titled it, Ruth, A Redemption Story. It is a story uh, about uh, the redemption of really God's people. It really has in it, interwoven in it you and I's story. Why? Because as a result of what God was doing through Ruth, now putting her in the lineage of David, ultimately to be the lineage of Christ, brings about uh, our redemption. And so her redemption is really a four uh, picture of what ultimately would become the redemption of all mankind. And so today we look at chapter 2 in this, what some have called one of the greatest love stories in all of the Bible. Uh, I certainly see that. And we're going to look here at just really some, some practical things that Ruth was doing that, that positioned her. And this is kind of really what I want to have for you as the take home today. What positioned her to experience the best that God had for her. Let me ask you this question before we get to our text this morning. Have you ever felt like you were just kind of seemingly always in the wrong place at the wrong time? Anybody in here? It's just like, man, if I had been there yesterday or had, had, I, had, I, had, had I done this at that point, I would, boy, I would have been really in the right spot. You, you always feel like you're just kind of just, just outside of the blessing. You're the one that, that never wins the raffle. Do you, you, any, any of you still a little bit bitter because you've never won a raffle along with your pastor? I've bought so many blooming raffle tickets. Now, see, y'all aren't confessing. I've never won a raffle. I'd like for somebody just to rig one where I could win it. One, I said that, didn't I? But, but, but you just feel like you just, you, sometimes you're just always just not quite there. Well, here's what I want you to, to, to focus in on this morning, that there was some things that Ruth did in this story, that, and, and also some things that I think you and I can do that will really position us to experience really the best that God has for us. Because it, this same thing is true in your own homes. Those of you that are parents uh, in here, for your children to have a, 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 a blessed and enjoyable and happy day today, there are certain things that they can do that will promote that in your home. Now, also, let's just say that for them to have a painful, frustrating, tragic day, there are some things that they could do to affect that in your home too. Is that the, that the truth? For instance, if your children got up this morning and made you breakfast, would you go in and beat them for it? Wasn't a trick question. How about if they burnt your car? A little bit different story. Again, I'm just trying to be extremely practical here. There are certain things that we can do, not only here in regard to relationship with our families, there are things that we can do that will affect us experiencing the, the, either the blessing of God or the, the chastisement of God. And Ruth did these things, and I think we can just learn a lot from uh, her, her uh, commitment here, if you will. Last week we looked at the, the, the heading of my choices, my consequences. Today we're looking at this subject, my commitment, my uh, re reward. Okay, My commitment, my reward. So stand with me, if you would, to honor the reading of the Word. And we're going to pick up our reading this morning. We're going to back up just a little bit into chapter 1 because these last couple of verses certainly set up the scene for what's happening in chapter 2. So starting in Ruth chapter 1, verse 21, if you found it, say amen. That's terrible. Y'all listen to, to, I know it's rainy and it's gloomy and we're just like, come on. What a nafe. Anybody like to nap on rainy days? Raise your hand if you like. If you don't, you may not be saved this morning if you don't like to nap. Everybody likes to nap on rainy days. Can I tell you when you can't do that now? Okay? Please wait till this afternoon to do that, all right? I'm telling you there's some good, good stuff that we find in here. So you all just at least act like you're halfway happy and awake here. Otherwise, if I catch you napping this morning, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to say some names. Now, if you found it, say Amen. 
Praise God, here we go. Here it is, verse one or verse 21, chapter 1. The Bible says, I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Now here it is. So that sets up chapter 2. Here it is. There was a relative of Naomi's husband, a, a man of great wealth of the family of Elimelech. His name was Boaz. So Ruth the Moabitess said that to Naomi, Please let me go to the field and glean heads of grain after him whose sight I may find favor. And she said to her, Go, my daughter. And then she left and went and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she had uh, or happened to come to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was in the family of Elimelech. Now, behold. Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, The Lord be with you. And they answered him, The Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, Who was in charge of the reapers? Whose young woman is this? This interesting phrase. We'll get to it in a little while, but very interesting. So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, uh, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. And she said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came and has continued from morning until now, uh, though she rested a little in the house. Then Boaz said to Ruth, You will listen, my daughter, will you not? And in other words, are you going to pay attention to what I have to say? That's a good question. Do not go out and glean in another field, nor go from here, but stay close to my young women. Uh, let your eyes be on the field which they reap and go after them. Have I not commanded the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. So she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? And Boaz answered and said to her, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband and how you have left your husband, excuse me, have left your father, she didn't leave her husband, and your mother and the land of your birth and have come to a people whom you did not know before. And the Lord repay you or repay your work and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel under whose wings you have come for refuge. And then she said, let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and have spoken kindly to your maidservant, though I am not like one of your maidservants. Now Boaz said to her at mealtime, come here and eat of the bread and dip your piece of bread in the vinegar. I would have liked it better if it had been gravy. Hallelujah. Amen. So she sat beside the reapers and he passed parts grain to her and she ate and was satisfied and kept some back. And when she arose to glean, Boaz commanded his young men saying, let her glean uh, even among the sheaves and do not reproach her. Also let grain from the bundles fall purposefully for her. Leave it that she may glean and do not rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening and beat out what she had gleaned. And it was about an ephah of barley. That's, we'll get to that later too. That's very interesting. And then she took it up and went into the city. And her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned, so she brought out and gave to her what she had kept back after she had been satisfied. And when her mother-in-law said to her, and her mother-in-law said to her, what or where have you gleaned uh, today? And where did you work? Blessed be the one who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name to whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he, let me get back to it. Blessed be he of the Lord who has not forsaken his kindness to the living and the dead. And Naomi said to her, This man is a relative of ours, one of our close relatives. Ruth the Moabitess said, He also said to me, You shall stay close by my young men until they have finished all my harvest. And Naomi said to, to, said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with this young woman and that people and that people do not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close by the young women of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and wheat harvest, and she dwelt with her mother-in-law. 
Father, in Jesus' name, we pray that you would bless uh, our reading of Scripture this morning. We pray, Father, that you would uh, uh, bless me, Father, as I preach and uh, uh, communicate what you have stirred my heart about this week. Uh, of how, Lord, that it is that we can position ourselves to experience and enjoy the fullness of the blessing of God in our life. I pray this morning, Lord, that you would challenge us, convict us if needs be, and, Lord, that you would bless us in our efforts to make you famous, Lord, wherever it is that we dwell, wherever it is that we work, wherever it is that we play, wherever it is that we go, God, that all would come to know that Jesus is Lord of our lives and wants to be of theirs as well. We bless you in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. You may be seated. Well, as we look at our text this morning, we're talking here again of this subject, my commitment, my reward. The fact is all throughout the scripture that God rewards commitment, does he not? The Bible is very clear that he says that as you sow, so shall you reap. That if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you will reap bountifully. Somehow, uh, some ignoramuses in the church have come along and said that, well, no, it's really the opposite. That if you want a great reward, then what you need to be is a bunch of sanctified tight wads and, 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 and really just hold back, give a trickle, and God will give a flood. Well, that's just against the principles of Scripture, uh, that if we pour into something, we abundantly reap from it. If we trickle into something, then it trickles back. And so we find that here uh, in this story uh, throughout. Now, we look last week really at the, the we're, we're seeing the, the various hours in the life of this young lady by the name of Ruth. So we've seen her last week, she was in an hour of decision. Her life had been flipped upside down. Probably everybody in here at some point can relate, life has been flipped upside down. Maybe it was through uh, a diagnosis of the doctor, maybe it was through a, 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 a horrific uh, incident or accident in your life, or a divorce, or a, a variety of things, but life I've got flipped upside down, and it's in those moments we make decisions about how it is it we're going to respond. I would personally say that it's better that we make those decisions before the incidents happen so that we're not making those decisions based upon emotions rather than uh, facts, rather than truth. In other words, that it's good for us to declare. If you, you know the words you're saying, well, I don't have any tragedies going on in my life. Great, I want to talk to you. It is important now that you just declare... This is who I'm going to be. I'm going to serve the Lord with gladness. I'm going to serve Him with faithfulness. Regardless of what comes, He's been good to me, and I'm going to be faithful to Him. Amen? If we do, amen? I thought I was in church. In other words, what I'm saying is I'm making a, a, a contract with myself. I'm not making a bargain with God. I'm making a contract with myself that, Travis, when difficulties come, because I expect them, right? If you don't, sorry, they're coming. You'll just be surprised. And when they come, what I'm doing is, is Trey, I'm saying that I'm not going to fall apart. I'm not going to turn into a nut. Can I say this? I'm, I'm going to anyway. So just go, uh-huh. We've got enough nuts. We've got enough freak shows in the church. Amen? Now, I know you're all going, who? <laughs> Maybe you if you don't know any. Amen? <laughs> We've got enough goobers. We've got enough uh, just, just, just craziness going on. What we're doing here is we're saying, I, I anticipate problems happening. I anticipate these days and these moments where it, it's not just that I had a bad day. It's not just that, 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 that I, I don't get to eat what I want. Chastity says I get cranky when I, don't, when, I, when I don't eat, when I get hungry. I don't believe it, but she says that I, I do. It's not that kind of thing. This is world turning upside down in our life kind of thing. What we're saying is, God, I'm not going to fall apart. Why? I said this earlier in the service. He's stable and the stabilizer of me. And so her world, Ruth's world, came undone. She had lost her husband. She now finds herself living with her mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law is now going back into a world that she does not know, back into Bethlehem, 
Her mother-in-law worships a God that she does not know. And so now she has to make this decision. She's in an hour of decision. What am I going to do? So she chooses wisely, and she decides that I'm not only going to follow my mother-in-law, most importantly, I'm going to go follow my mother-in-law's God, which is Jehovah. And it seemingly as though that she was more in love with Jehovah that time than, than what Naomi was. And so she said, this is what I'm going to do. So now, fast forward into chapter 2, we're not in the hour of decision, we're in the hour of service. And this, I just love this, because it's such a picture of what happens when somebody genuinely gets born again. Again. When they get born again, I want y'all to listen, don't miss this. When you get born again, you don't stay the same. I've been preaching this for over a decade now. We don't stay the same. When we get saved, when we're born again, we don't just go back to our jobs, back to our homes, back to our way of life, and just carry on and say, well, at least I'm not going to hell now. No, no, no. We, our whole life is turned upside down. The world is turned upside down in a good and a positive way. Why? Because I, we sang about this this morning. I just had a hard time not pitching a fit. I'm set free, man. I'm no longer chained to the sin that held me back. I no longer have to cuss. Somebody needed that. I don't have to cuss. I may want to from time to time, but I don't have to. I no longer have to be bound by addiction any longer. Why? Because he broke the chains. And it, well, how'd that happen? It happened by the redemption work of Christ on the cross and me making a decision to follow, a decision to say yes to Christ. And so now Ruth has made this decision and immediately her life changes. Immediately the things that she is is, is given her life to, they change. And so what I want to do this morning is kind of walk you through some of the things that, that we see in this narrative of what Ruth did now that she had made the decision to uh, follow Jehovah. The first thing that I want you to notice this morning uh, is this. This is really good. She saw the need. Well, what, what does that mean? Back up into chapter 1, and in all into uh, the way into verse two of chapter two, here's what we find of uh, Ruth. Ruth begins to notice this the, the plight of Naomi. She understands that she's destitute. She understands that, that that she not only does she not have her husband living any longer to provide for her, but she doesn't have her sons to provide for her. Well, if their situation different in that day than it certainly is in our day here in America, but very male-dominated society in that day, and if you didn't have as a woman a husband or uh, uh, sons to take care of you, you're in a mess. I mean, you're in a, you're in a fix. Matter of fact, you're, you're in a spot that really you've set God up to do a miracle because you're going to need one. And, and, and most commentators believe that Naomi was either uh, too old or, or, or physical ailments enough that she was probably not going to be able to take care of herself, probably couldn't get a job uh, to speak of, so she really needed some help. What's interesting that immediately after Ruth makes this decision to trust Jehovah with her life, she sees a need in the life of her mother-in-law. Now, it's interesting how God changes our perspective that whenever we get saved, we see things different than we saw them before. Is that the truth for anybody that's saved in here this morning? In other words, I, I see people t today as, as opportunities to, to be a blessing in their life. I see people not as obstacles anymore. I used to see people as obstacles. You're just in my way of what I'm wanting to accomplish. You're, you're, you're just aggravating me. And, and let me, can I keep it real this morning? Some people still aggravate me, amen? I know you're all like, no, we just pray. That's all we do for people. Well, I, anyway, I, some people aggravate me, but I still, I see them, and I have, now Chastity doesn't believe what I'm about to say, I still, I do have some compassion for people. I do, sweetie, I, I do. I, do. I, I no longer see them the way that I did, and I, I, I see needs all around me. Can I tell you before why I didn't see needs around me and why some of you may this morning saying, I just don't see the needs around me. Can I tell you why? Because you're not looking for them. Why? Because you're looking at you. Your life consists of you. Your world consists of you. Your whole world is constructed by you. It centers upon you. The, 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 the main course and the side dishes, even the dessert is you of your life. 
It's all about the, the job that you'll get or the one that you have. It's all about the money you'll make or the money you won't. It's all about the career you're building or will build. It's all about the, 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 the points you'll score in the game. It's all about the, the relationships that you want to have or, or, or want to get out of. It's all about you. And the reality is the more you focus on you, the less you notice and see the needs around you. But I want you to notice something here as we look in this scripture. What Ruth was doing is really a, a great picture of what happens in the life of a believer when we get saved that we genuinely begin to see with spiritual eyes that there are people in desperate states all around us that need us to pay attention. There's needs in the church that need us to see with spiritual eyes. There's needs in your job that that need you to see with spiritual eyes. There are people that live on your street that need you to see them with spiritual eyes. Some of you have got some aggravating people in your life. Don't shout their name in church this morning, please. But you have some aggravating people in your life. Just, just say, praise the Lord, if that's true. Okay. Can I tell you, those people are not sent in your life to be an obstacle for you, but an opportunity for you to show the grace of Jesus into their life. It had been so easy for Ruth. I thought about this this week. It had been so easy for Ruth to have acted like a modern-day church member. She could have came back to Bethlehem. Man, I'm just now serving Jehovah. You know what she could have done? She could have came back immediately and, and, and got into Bethlehem and said, well, you know what? This is pretty bad. Bethlehem should have had a better program to help feed the needy and the poor. Doesn't that sound like modern-day America right there? I mean, that, there's a lot of folks that are barking about that, complaining and whining and griping about the fact that we should have had better programs. We should have had a better outreach uh, system. We even had somebody, I remember last year when we were down feeding uh, uh, our, at our annual Feed Tahlequah event, I literally had on that day a lady approach me angry and mad because our church didn't care about the hungry in Tahlequah. And I'm like, are you kidding? I literally said, are you kidding me? This is the wrong day and the wrong church to say that to. Why? Because we were there feeding them. So there's so many today that that's what they're doing. But listen, what Ruth didn't do was come back and complain about the issue. Ruth came back and she saw the need. Well, what did she do? Can I tell you, here's a, as, a, as a follower of Christ, here's the next logical step. If you see the need, here it is. Are y'all, this is profound. Took me all week to put this together. You ready? She sought a solution. She didn't call a senator. She didn't call the pastor. She didn't call a deacon. She didn't call a Sunday school teacher. She didn't gripe. She didn't complain. She sought a solution. You know what she did? She said, hey, I guess what? I, I'll go to work. Isn't that interesting? This is, so, this is so simple, but yet it's so profound. Imagine what that would be like in the church if we came together and when we as we get saved, following Christ, I see needs now that, Ben, I'm starting to say, hey, how can I be a part of the solution rather than coming to you and saying, what is your problem? How come you're not fixing this? Why am I hurting and you're not helping? But Ruth came and she said, I think I could go out and glean. Well, what was that? Gleaning was about, this is what the poor did. And so it was part of the Levitical law that whenever you're out in the fields, uh, in your harvest, that you leave the corners. That you could not, I don't have time to go into this. You can go back and read this in Leviticus. I love this. That, that you, and this, if you've never farmed, you don't really totally understand this probably, but I have. And so, so as you're, you, you, when, you're, when you're out farming the field, running your combines, and uh, you, 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 you come back and get the corners often last, and that you just kind of tread that out. So what the Levitical law was is that you would leave the corners. Why? Because of the poor could come in, and they could work in the corners and get enough food to survive. It was a benevolent act of God to, to do such a thing. So what here in this picture here is uh, Ruth is saying, now we've came back here into the barley harvest. I see our need. Uh, Naomi's really a, a mess, and she was bitter. On, isn't, isn't that fun to have a bitter friend? Amen. You ever had one? And just like nothing you say can get them together, and so sometimes you just kind of just put y'all are smiling because you probably have one. If you've never had one, you may be the one, okay? And your friends are just going, bless her heart. 
his heart, whoever. Okay, so she's they're, they're in the barley harvest, and, and and now this guy by the name of Boaz comes on the scene. He is uh, what what and we'll know this. Uh, this phrase later, he is called the kinsman redeemer, okay? Meaning he was part of their relation, but also there was a Levitical law that that if uh, in their plight, in Naomi's plight, okay, she's lost husband, she's lost uh, her boys. Now in in uh, Ruth's plight, she's lost her husband. She has nobody to take care of them. And so the, the, the Levitical law says is the closest of kin, often it would be a brother to the one who had died, is now uh, has the ability to come and redeem his land, if you will, and also along with that you get the woman. Anybody glad we've progressed? <laughs> I thought about that this week. I'm like, this is so not our culture today, um, you know, because because our, our culture today, there's some good about it, obviously, because they're taking care of, of 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 widows here, and obviously we're all about that. Uh, but yet, you just basically you just went and said, "Yeah, I'll take you." <laughs> some of you guys are still doing that. There's a better way, okay. Um, but he would go and do that. Well, there was one, you find this out later, that, that was closer in this story comes about, that, that this guy by the name of Boaz now is the guy that is going to redeem them. So he gets all of the land, and yet he has Ruth to come uh, to be his own. And you'll find out his, his romantic tendencies here in a little bit, and it's really a, a really neat story. But in the midst of all of this, what you find here is Ruth, as she sees this need and she's now seeking out the solution, Ruth is saying, I'm going to go out and I'm going to, I'm going to make this happen for us. I'm going, to, I'm going to serve. I'm not going to gripe. I'm not going to complain. I'm going to be the one to go out and take care of our family. Here it is. It's a decision, a commitment she had to take care of the family that positioned her in a spot to where she would get now the glance of this guy by the name of Boaz. Here's how the story shifts. Up until now, the story is about Ruth. The story is about Naomi. It's all about Ruth and Naomi. It's about Ruth and Naomi. Now the story shifts, and whenever you see the picture of Ruth, now it's all about this guy by the name of Boaz. Boaz this, Boaz that. Boaz this, Boaz that. You say, well, okay, hang on. What, What does all this practically mean to us? Isn't that the way it should be whenever we come to faith in Christ? You see, before I came to faith in Christ, my life was what I described a while ago. It was me, me, me. I had ambitions. I had dreams. I had goals. I had all of these different things that I wanted to do. But can I tell you, and my wife will attest to this, when I got saved and gave my life to Jesus, man, I'm telling you the narrative, the focus, the center of my life changed. It was now Jesus. It was now. I started using phrase. Saved people will talk about things like this, God's will. God's call, God's commission, God's uh, uh, desire. And I started using phrases like that. Why? Because the moment I got saved, I didn't want to live for me any longer. I didn't want to live without purpose any longer. I wanted to live with a purpose that was serving him and him alone. And so now you see Ruth coming, and this picture here of Boaz is a, is a, a Christ-type picture for us. All through the Old Testament, you have these, these typecasts, and Boaz is a typecast to us of Christ. And so in the midst of this, I love this, here she is out there gleaning in the field. Okay, she just out there working, and, and, and to what we know, there was a whole uh, host of other uh, men and women gleaning in the field. So arrives this man by the name of Boaz, and Boaz says, who she belonged to. Translation, this is, this is rough. She's hot. Uh-huh. She, she caught his eye. Now, now, some have said, well, it really wasn't about beauty. Now, now listen, li- li- listen. She was different than any of the rest of them. She didn't look like all the rest of them. Well, she's a foreigner, okay? She, she, I mean, so, so she doesn't look like all the other gals in Bethlehem. She stood out, and Boaz, he, he glances out in this field, and he says, not, not just who is she, but whose is she? In other words, he's immediately saying, Hubba, hubba. <laughs> ah, mm-hmm, mm, yeah, Ruthie, he's, he's smitten with her, 
He, he's, he's overcome with, about her. Why? why? Be, because he, he spots her in the crowd. Now, now, now listen, there, there's, there's some fun in this. Now, and, and the fun really happens. Don't miss next week. I'm telling you, there's some stuff next week that'll, yeah, anyway, it, it, just don't miss it. There's some fun in this of the fact that, that, that every man in this room that is married or dating, did you, did you not, when you started dating, did you, did you spot your significant other in the room and said, oh, my goodness. Or did you just walk up and say, I'll take one of those. <laughs> I mean, this is some juicy stuff, right? I mean, any woman in the room want to just be one of the old gals? Any woman in the room just want to be one of the, uh, yeah, I was, there's a whole herd of us standing out there, and he just went out and said, well, take the tall one. <laughs> no, you want him looking out there and saying, wow, look at that. I want that. You say, okay, well, what's the practical? That's, that's fine, but what's the practical? Can I, can I tell you what? I, I just really believe that the typecast practical take home of this is this is what God does to us. He sees us in the midst of there, there's seven billion people here on earth, and He looks down from heaven and looks and says, Wow! Look, look at that! There's Scott, I'll take him. Look at David and Yvonne, I'll take both of them. Look at uh, Travis. I, Maybe? No, I want Travis. This, this is what God does. He, he's smitten with us. Well, you say, well, how do you know that? He loved us so much, he sent a son to die on a cross for us. And as he's looking here in the midst of all of these billions of people, and he doesn't look at us as the crowd, he sees us as the individual and says, who do you belong to? Whose are you? What a beautiful picture of what Boaz is offering to Ruth that God offers to us. And I believe the thing that, that stands out to me here is not just this overwhelming statement of Boaz, but also the practical, don't miss this, the practical step that Ruth took to position herself to be seen. Now, I don't think we have to do things for God to see us. Why? Because he's omniscient he has all knowledge he's omnipresent he's everywhere he's omnipotent he has all power but I think there are practical things that we do such as this that position us to experience the best can I, can I tell you who I think is the most miserable people in the world are people who are dabbling with religion dabbling with faith in Christ I really do that, oh yeah I, I said that prayer thing you guys do and I, I went in that, that tank thing you guys do and, and, and I, go to, I go to church from time to time you never experience what God has for you. You never experience the benefit and the blessing and the bounty that God has, has abundantly provided for you. And it comes back to this step that you didn't take, this practical decision you didn't make, this practical commitment you didn't make to position you for his best. And so she sought this solution and she experienced this glance from Boaz. And so here's what happens next. I've got to move quickly. Uh, she, she secured a position. Verses t 3 through 8, she, she began to work in such a way that she wasn't, um, she wasn't wanting to just now say, hey, can I get through today? But, hey, how, how could I, I build here for the future? Because obviously we're going to need to eat tomorrow. And, 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 and that's, I, I related with this because whenever I'm eating, I'm not necessarily just thinking about right now. I'm thinking, this will be good tomorrow. Amen? I mean, I wonder if we could come back here. Um, I, I wonder if we could have this. Like if I'm eating Mexican food today, I'm thinking, could we have this Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and, and the other days and end with why? Could, could we have that? So now she's, she's seeking out this, the, the, or securing this position of saying that I, I want to make sure that we're taken care of. And, and you, you see that here in the text. Well, what was happening was is she's now experiencing the, the, the guidance of Christ in her life, the guidance of God. The scripture says in Psalm 32, 8, he said, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. He said, I will guide you with my eye. Can I tell you why so many people are just wandering aimlessly on earth? 
because they've not positioned themselves to be led of God. They, they, don't, they don't hear God. They don't, they don't experience it. Why? Because they're not in the Word. They're not sitting under biblical teaching. And whenever it comes time to make decisions, they're saying, man, I just wish I knew what God's will was. Well, well guess what? There's a, there's a prescribed way that we find that out. We spend time with Him. And so now we find in this picture here, again, a picture of what God gives to us in Boaz, verses 8 and 9. He gives this incredible, generous offer uh, to her. And, and it really is this, it's, it's a picture of this, the incredible good grace of God given to us. So here again, something we didn't earn, something we didn't deserve. I, I read a, a commentator uh, by the name of John Phillips. He's a little Englishman. He's gone on to be with the Lord now. He, I wrote some things in my notes that he said that is, is here in this text. He said the first thing we notice here is he said the picture of separation. Uh, Boaz told her, he said, now don't go off and be like these others. I want you to stay here in that. In other words, don't, don't just follow the crowds around. If you'll stay with me, I'll take care of you. Also, the picture here of, big word here, sanctification. Well, what does that mean? That literally means to be set apart for the work of something, okay? And so what Boaz is doing here is he's saying, I want you to be set apart to work in my field. So it's a picture here of what God does in our life now that we're saved. He also, and I love this part, there's a picture of security. He said, have I not, have I not told my young men not to touch you? What, what is that? He's saying, you're safe here. You're secure here. Reminder, Bethlehem was no Mayberry at, at the time. Bethlehem was a, a mess. It, it, was, it was a whole lot better picture of, of uh, Detroit than Mayberry, okay? It, uh, Bethlehem was, was a lot of, of bad stuff going on. And here's what he's saying. He's saying, if you will trust me and stay here, you are secure here. Because I told my guys, hands off, she's mine. Y'all don't get this. I, I can already tell you don't get the spiritual significance here. This is what God has said to the devil. Hands off their mind. You can't touch them without coming through me. Go back to the book of Job. Do you remember in Job who brought up Job's name first? Well, it was the devil. He went, no, 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 no. Uh-uh. God brought up Job's name. Do you remember what the devil did to Job? Yeah, it was terrible, but it was nothing without first getting permission from God. In other words, what God is saying is, I'm in charge of their life. You don't touch them without going through me. And now we see in Ruth's life, Boaz is saying, I got you. Somebody needs that this morning. God, God, God's, God's literally saying to you this morning, if you've put your faith, I've got you. You don't have to worry uh, about this, it, can, 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 we are professional worriers, are we not? Any, any worriers in the room this morning? You just worry about stuff? So, some, sometimes, here's what some of you will do. You'll worry because you're not worried. That's, that's the truth before God. Some of you are worried today because I'm, I'm not worried. I wonder what I'll do. I'm worried that, that, that they, some of you can't celebrate the good of God because you're, 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 you're worried that it's going to turn bad. God's blessing you like, well, I, I can't celebrate because I know it's, churches do this. Churches will have an incredible day. Hundreds of people may get saved. Well, yeah, but the devil's coming. Really? May we not cheat ourselves out of rejoicing in what Christ is doing over the statement that the devil is coming. I'm telling you, we, we rob ourselves of, of joy and blessing because always, well, yeah, but the devil's going to come. Can I remind you, he is whipped. He is, he is defeated at the cross. Christ did not just barely win. He overcame him, defeated him, and he is under his feet. Y'all just let me pitch a fit up here then. So, so here's what she did. I'm, I'm, we're going to close. She showed appreciation. Can I just remind you, this is a natural progression of our life. If you're saved, you begin to immediately engage in the work of God. You're immediately concerned about not just your own future. I'm not talking about here on earth, but the f f f your future in heaven. You're concerned about the future of others. You're looking for needs to, to be able to meet. You enjoy the overwhelming blessing and grace and goodness, favor of God. But can I remind you that this is, 
This is a mark of a true, genuine believer. It's not somebody who's arrogant talking about what they've earned or how much better they are than the next person or a church talking about how much better uh, they are, translation, bigger they are, uh, which I don't know where we got that, that bigger is, is, is always better. But the mark of a, of a genuine, sold out, born again, Holy Ghost-filled believer of God is that they show appreciation for what God's done in their life. Appreciation for the fact that I'm I'm, I'm really, I'm reaping better than I've sowed. I'm, I'm enjoying benefits that I didn't earn. Any, anybody got that testimony this morning? I'm enjoying benefits of that which I did not earn. Every safe person in the room this morning has that. And so Ruth indicates this. I want you to draw your attention uh, into, my page is turned, uh, in, into chapter 2 to verse 10. I want you to see what she did here. Uh, she said, and so, so she fell on her face, bowed to the ground. This is after he's extended this goodness. Stay in my field. I'll protect you. Fell on the ground, face to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Now, now listen, th- th- this is not just, hey, thanks, bud. Because that's, that's kind of how we show thanks, Right? We, we don't want to get over, uh, you know, like carried away with showing thanks. This is an extravagant way of showing thanks. When, let me ask you this. When was the last time somebody bowed down on the ground whenever you did something kind for them? Has it ever happened? Anybody? Would that be awkward? Amen. Would it not? I mean, uh, Ben, come, come here. Go, go, go ahead. Come on. Come on. Yeah, we're all waiting on you, Ben. The whole world live streaming. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on, give that little girl away. Y'all encourage Ben. Y'all encourage Ben. Come on up here. C- come stand right here, w- would you? Um, now, now <clears throat> Ben is my buddy, and, and it, you know, it's my birthday coming up this week. It's birthday week. Okay, it, it is. And so you're probably going to want to do something extravagant for me and and uh, I'm a duck hunter now. I need a duck boat, and so you could do that and something like that. But anyway, I- imagine this with me, okay? Could you, could you if, if you would? Ben goes out, and he just he blows me away. We're going to do something extravagant. He's going to get me a duck boat. That's what he's going to do. I just know he will. If, if he's saved, that's what he's... <laughs> Amen. So, so imagine my response, because I want to show you the, the extravagance of this. Imagine, Gary, my response to Ben. He gives me this duck boat. It wasn't the typical, hey, buddy, thanks, man. This is going to be fun. You ought to go duck hunt with me. But no, 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 no. Here's what I did. I got down, and I'm, I'm, I'm before. Is this awkward yet? Is it awkward to you? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course, it's a little bit more awkward with all these people and, and the millions watching online. But, but unbelievable extract. This is not just thank you. This is... You're unbelievable. This is, there's no way I could repay you. This is, um, you have my life now. And though that is really odd and awkward amongst friends, that ought to be the safest, most comfortable place in the world between us and God. Do do, do y'all get that? Y'all clap for Ben as he goes back and says, thank you, buddy. She's saying not just, hey, thanks for my duck boat. Or not, hey, just thanks for a meal. Because that was the first step of this is that, that he's given a meal. But thanks for giving me life back. That, that's, a, that's a picture of us to Christ and what we've been given. He didn't just, can I just remind he didn't just give us a new activity for Sundays. He gave us life. That shouldn't be out of the norm for a child of God to be just prostrate before God and saying, Oh God, I'm overwhelmed with your kind of goodness and generosity to me. And lastly is this, and here I think is the most, I think is the most um, overlooked, but yet should be the most common among us. With this generosity that's been given to us, what, what, what should be our response? Not just showing appreciation, but here it is. She shared her reward. What God's given to me, I, I, it, it's not just for me. Can I just say that to you this morning? What God's given to you is not just for you. I don't know who in here needs that. I, can I just say, all of us, I need it. 
If you look here in this text, what happened was is uh, over and over, and I just, we don't have time to go through each verse of this because this, it's narrative in this way, but, but, but in the story here, he, he doesn't just say, hey, you're blessed. He doesn't just say, hey, here's a meal. He actually just says, hey, no, he, I, I'm securing food for you, but also I want you to come into my home. I want you now to come and sit at my table. I want you to come and dip here into the bowl that I'm, I, I mean, that's into, I don't even like to share salsa with people at the Mexican restaurant. Hallelujah. I don't think you should either. But anyway, I, he's saying, come, come dip in the bowl. She's overwhelmed and saying, how have I found such favor here? And her natural tendency was is that she, she took this back. She went back to Naomi and she's saying, you can't believe what, na- listen, what we've been blessed with. She immediately began to see that which she had been given is now ours and not mine. Well, this had helped the church today, would it not? That what is, we see it in this way, that what is mine is mine. Why? Because I earned it. No, you didn't. No, you, well, yeah, I did. I worked hard. No, no, no. So listen to what I'm saying. You didn't do anything God didn't allow you to do. You, oh, yeah, now this is the part where you're going to say, I couldn't breathe if he didn't give me breath. Yeah. You'd be dead. You're done. You're nothing without him. No breath comes through your lungs without him. Energy you have, you have from him. Some of you are saying, I wish I had more. Some of you are saying, I wish I had less. Especially for your three-year-olds. Amen. Amen. But she came and she said, all that I have, all that's been given to me is now, it's, 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 it's ours. So Ruth began to to share this kindness, this this reward that had been given to her. Now, what's interesting, I told you we would get to this in verse 17. Uh, If you look there, it said that she had picked and gleaned about an ephah of barley. Now, I know you're on face value, you're like, okay, an ephah, who cares? Is that a gallon or half a gallon? What do we know? Okay, why don't you listen to this? When giving instructions to the Israelites about manna, you remember when they're going through the wilderness and God's dropping manna down, he gave them instructions. Here's how much you can go and and get for the day. Why? Because God wanted to teach them, you trust me every day for your provision. God said if you get too much, it'll rot. The worms will eat it. It'll be no good to you. What God is teaching them is you need to trust me daily for your provision. So in giving them these instructions, how much each man should gather, God said in Exodus 16, 16, an omer for every man. Now, I know it would be better if he said a pint or something, but it's an omer, okay? So he said an omer for every man. Later, we would be told that an omer is a tenth part of an ephah. So stay with me. Ruth went and gleaned an ephah. An omer is a tenth part of an ephah. Ruth came away, literally, listen to this, with ten times that which she needed. She came empty and went away full. Opposite of what you're seeing Naomi saying, I went out full and came back empty. Why? Naomi walked out into sin. Naomi walked out of the will of God full and came back. This is so good. Y'all are just kind of looking at me like you're ready for your nap. Wake up, this is good. She walked out into sin full and came back empty. Reminder this week, sin will always cost you more than you want to pay. Always. Well, I'm just dabbling with it. No, no, no. It will always cost you more than you want to pay. She went out full, came back empty. Ruth went out empty into the will of God and came back full. Ten times more. What was the picture? The picture is you just can't outgive God. Can't do it. So I want to close with these two statements. To enjoy God's best, it demands your yes. Some of you may still be experiencing unbelievable frustration in your walk with God. It may very well be the reason for that is that you've, you've, you've not given your yes, you've given your conditional, maybe, we'll see. You ever said that when somebody's asking you something? Hey, could I, could I, could I ask a favor of you? We'll see. Yeah, raise your hand if you've done that. We'll, we'll see. You know, what, you know what you're doing? It's conditional, right? Chastity and I will do that from time to time with, with one another. Hey, could I ask a favor from you? 
Hmm. What is it we say? What is it? We'll see. Maybe. Huh? Yeah, I say that. She, she's holy. She would never say anything. She's like, anything you want, Master. Amen. That's just, <clears throat> it doesn't go quite that way. We're conditional about it. Why? Because we're really not trusting the one that we're giving the favor to. We're really not trusting that they would ask only that which is best for us. Can I, can I remind her? We're talking about Christ. We're talking about the, 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 the Savior of the world, the, the perfect one, the holy one. To enjoy God's best, it demands our yes. Well, what does that fully mean? Here's, here's the last statement. We're going to close. Our yes to the will and the mission of God is the key that unlocks the door to enjoying God's best for us. God's never going to lead you to do something outside of his will and his mission for your life. His will and mission for the church. So literally what we're saying here is, is, is our yes to the will of God, whatever that, 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 that takes me to do, whatever, wherever that takes me to do it. Our yes to the mission of God, meaning that every day as I live, I'm not just li- it's not about me today. It's not about serving my interests. It is about meeting the needs of others. It is about serving the will of God. That's what the mission of God is about. That is what unlocks the door to the best that God has for me. Now, preacher, does that mean that if we say yes to God, that we have no problems? That's not at all what we've said all morning. We still understand that we experience trials and difficulties, but the reality is, even in the midst of those, we can find the goodness and the grace of God to be strong and to be true and to be faithful. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to live a life of just experiencing chastisement, of experiencing that dreading to see the the chastiser. Because, see, when we're out of the will of God, we don't really want to be around God, right? When I disobeyed my dad, can I tell you the last person in the world I wanted to hang out with was my dad? seemed like he was always mad whenever I disobeyed. Isn't that profound? My dad was always mad whenever I disobeyed. He never just came home and said, man, what a rotten boy you are. That's awesome. Here's some ice cream. That's called parenting today. Don't break their spirit. No, you break their behind. That's what you need to do. Amen? The picture here is is that God says, I love you too much to not chasten you. I'm not going to leave you to yourself if you step out of my will. I'm not going to let you sin successfully. Our yes has to be on the table to experience the best God has for us. And guess what? Here here it is. Here's where where we close. That yes needs to precede a knowledge of what the yes is to. What? God doesn't tell us in advance what all is coming. I'm thankful. I don't know if I've ever said this to you. I've said this a lot before, but I don't know if I've ever said this publicly. Had God told me what was ahead of me in 2007, I would have never left Missouri and came to this church to be a pastor. Wouldn't have done it. Why? My first three years, let's just say they weren't pleasant. That, that's, a, that's, that's the understatement of the year. My first three years here were not pleasant. We had good moments, but they were hard. God didn't tell me what was ahead. Had he told me, hey, first three years, it's going to be tough. It's going to be hard. I might have figured out a way to say, I don't think God's in this. Because God's all about this blessing and, 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 and love. And, and we love each other in Missouri. And they're not going to love me in Oklahoma. But God didn't tell me. You know what we did? We stepped out in faith. That's what yes does with God. I'm stepping out in faith. I don't know what's out there, but I know you're there. And that's enough for me. So there may be for some of you. I'm really kind of guessing all of us. A step of faith that God's dealing with us about in our own life that may be in regards to your relationship, your job, your finances. There may be somebody in here this morning, the very thing that you've been holding out from God is you've not been tithing. That's, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's step one in regards to experiencing God's best for your finances. Some of you not sharing the gospel. That's step one of being a Christian. You say, really, that's step one? Yeah. Why would you have this and not tell it? So here's what I'm going to ask of you this morning. Would you be willing to put your yes on the table? 
for whatever God's asking for for next, even if you don't know what that is? Would you be willing today to say, I want God's best so much for me that my faith is just saying yes today. I don't, I don't know what yes to what. Some of you may know exactly what yes is about. Maybe about surrendering a call that God's placed on your life to ministry or to missions. It might be about uh, surrendering to the, the call of God to go and be an evangelist this year in your school or in your job. It might be about forgiving somebody. You've been holding a grudge about. But here's what I know. God knows your language. He knows how to speak to you. The answer is today, or the question is today, are you willing to say yes?